We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata. Mike, what's up? Uh, was just telling you, got a new laptop. That's cool. Exciting. Um, I've been using my fiance's laptop for like, oh God, probably about six months. So I finally got my own, his mind crapped out. I don't know what happened, but I think it was something to do. It got too cold because it was near an air conditioner. And then I bought a new battery. I tried to replace the battery and then it worked for a day. So I couldn't send that battery back in and then it crapped again. And I was like, okay, well, that's just unfortunate. Well, I'm glad you have a new laptop. It's really important. It's perfect timing because uh, training camp just a few weeks away. And honestly, I think we're, I think the whole social media NFL football world is officially ready for something football related every single week until the mid middle of February. So I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to get started on training camp battles, all of it. Yeah. But the big question, not training camp battle, Barbie or Oppenheimer. Is that next week? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's going to, I'm, I'm going to say Barbie. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm all in. I want to see it. It looks so cool. The premiere looks awesome. Um, they're in London, New York, all of it. I am super pumped about it. And yeah, I'm, I'm a Barbie fan. I'm not going to lie. Nick, good call on the double feature. Although, I don't know. It's a Christopher Nolan movie. It's probably like three hours. Probably just want to watch that one alone. I have a local drive-in, which those still exist. Uh, yeah. And they put up a question because they're doing the Barbie on opening night and they're asking what should be the double feature i can't remember all of them but i voted for 2002 scooby-doo that'd be a good one i love throwbacks well that's what they do um over in covington they'll play every okay. day of like once a month the beginning of the month they'll do an old school og movie i think they're doing dazed and confused in the month of july and then they do a new one every month and it's really cool because it's on the river big screen you get to see the city skyline and i love that get the throwback movies i know i could go on my tv and stream them and watch something but three hours long that's what i said i told you it's a christopher nolan movie it's gonna be three hours Nah, my attention span is, isn't ready for three hours. If you've noticed some of the other movies, even the 90s or early 2000 movies, they're like an hour and a half long. Oh, what happened to the tight 90 minute movie? You could go in an hour mm. and a half. You're back. Now that's a TV episode. That is no longer movie time. Even animated movies like they have to be, all be two hours plus or they're not movies. And I just like, man, let me go in there. No, <laughs> especially, especially, especially when the movie is. There's no need for it to be that long, like just like a dumb action flick or something. Not sorry. I'm not gonna name anything, but just uh okay. The one coming up, I want to see the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If that thing's like two and a half hours, I don't understand why. Like I just no. want to see the, the Ninja Turtles eat pizza, fight some ninjas, and I'm out. You know, like hour and a half. I used to think that was a scary movie when I was a kid. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja. Oh, the the live action one. Yeah, but okay, I had that makes more brothers, sense. so I, I didn't yeah. know. We always had the Ninja Turtle stuff everywhere, and I was like, "That's scary. I'm not watching that." Uh, <laughs> but now it's pretty funny to look back on. But yeah, movies, summertime, training camp is a few weeks away, and topic of conversation actually solid. I'll give credit to where it is due. Paul Daner had a piece out earlier this week when it comes to breakout player of the year. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to read it, but um, I'm hearing it was Dax Hill for Paul Daner. And I thought, you know what? Why not? We're mid-July. Let's come out with our breakout players of the year. We could look at the midway point of the season, who that's going to be. But for me personally, let's do it right before training camp. You are going to go first. Okay. Is it just one player? We're doing one on each side. This Behind the scenes, this is how much prep we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're so good at that prep stuff. Um, I would say let's just pick one right now because we are pretty, we're running pretty heavy in our first segment. Okay. Um. I, the obvious one to me would be Irv Smith, and that's re entirely reliant on health. Uh, I think if you're going to go offense, that's almost just where you have to go. Mm -hmm. But I think I want to look, I think I'd look defensively, and there's a small thing of why this might not work, but I'm going to go with an exciting one Joseph Osai. Uh, I think I don't think he's going to start because they just have two guys in that position. But can he be 
Because I don't think Miles Murphy, I think Miles Murphy's going to get plenty of snaps, but I don't think he's going to push Osai off the field year one. I just think Miles Murphy, his archetype of player is that guy is a year three, maybe year two guy. This year, it's all about getting him reps, getting him used to the NFL. Osai, I thought last year, at times it really flashed, but his best game was the last game of the year. I thought his best game was that Chiefs game before the penalty but consistently bringing pressure consistently he's beating now Bengals left tackle Orlando Brown <laughs> and the Chiefs left tackle now is worse than that so uh in that matchup maybe you want to put him in there a little bit but he could flash some really impressive moves he could flash some really impressive skill set I don't think it was all there for him yet and I don't think they gave him enough snaps I don't think they took Hendrickson and um Hubbard off the field enough especially early on in the year for him to really make the dent. But I think it was year one, he missed the entire year. Year two, we get the flashes, we get some really good games. And now year three, I think he puts it together enough that you kind of go, ooh, wow, like this guy, this guy start in a lot of different places. Or maybe he's going to put up, what what constitutes a breakout? Because my mind says, could he pull six sacks? Whoa. I think. Yeah, no, I, I'm fully in. I, like, okay. I think if he gets the role, I think he could put up six sacks this year or so. Um, yeah, that I think Joseph Osai would be my breakout. Run, def, run, run defense, that I think could determine how many snaps he gets. He mm-hmm. hasn't been stellar. He hasn't been terrible, but he hasn't been stellar at it enough to push anybody off the field early on in early downs, which forces them to really just try to use him in those passing downs. And then you get weird situations like he's rushing – in right outside the guard instead of he should be on the edge, just using his athleticism and talent there. Cause that's where he's better off. Uh, but yeah, we'll go Joseph Osai edge rusher. My bold prediction, I guess is six sacks this year. So we said, I'm going to stay with the sack uh, conversation right now, because we said miles Murphy. I want to say when we were talking about him this off season, we, I think we both agreed three, maybe three, three and a half. You're Stand looking up. for three. Yeah. We'll say that he got three and a half. Maybe even four. Maybe I'm optimistic. And we know what his role is. I think we know what his role is going to be as a rookie year. And then Joseph Asai gets six. What do you expect of the other guys? So you might see, like, I don't, if this is the case, those guys are going to be stealing snaps from the guys in front of them. Uh, I think Hubbard would probably also be somewhere in that six range is what you might be able to expect. And then Hendrickson. I know he broke the record two years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't think he would be doing that. I think you might get more efficiency out of him, but you won't get the same amount of volume because he would be coming off the field, getting breathers, getting rest. Maybe Hendrickson, and I think this is actually what he ended up near last year, would be like eight. Lead the team just under, or maybe he does hit 10 and get double digits, but it would be very efficient numbers rather than just, man, that guy played, like, not that he wasn't efficient two years ago, but mm-hmm. it was also like, man, that guy played so many snaps. <laughs> and then uh, also the efficiency, that's how you end up with that many sacks. But yeah, look, uh, well, how many sacks is that? that that's a, it's quite a few now. That like is. Th- three, six, 12, 15, and then 23 from those four. I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't know. Maybe it is. Well, I mean, that's that should be the topic of conversation. You want to get better out on the defensive line anyways. And I think you, you bring up a really great point with Joseph Asai. I know it's so easy to connect the last game the Cincinnati Bengals played. But if that hit doesn't happen, and I still don't really blame him for what happened, the, the late hunt on Patrick Mahomes. I get it. I get why it was a flag. But at the same time, I know he had a really good game. And it's really unfortunate because I think if the Bengals would have been able to win that game, or maybe even that hit doesn't happen, I think we're talking about Joseph Asai, what we saw from him in his first real season in the NFL and um, the optimism is there and I'm, I'm really excited to see that and what that rotation is going to look like because I mean even going back on draft night when they drafted Miles Murphy I know he was in for a lot of visits but I'm like I was a little surprised maybe maybe we could say he was a little surprised that he was there for a lot of teams I know Kansas City the Philadelphia Eagles would have loved 
Uh, would have loved if uh, Miles Murphy would have been there if the Bengals didn't take him. So it was a huge pickup for them. And I, I just really can't wait to see what that's going to look like on the defense side of the wall because the topic of conversation for a lot of outsiders is the secondary and some of the new guys out there replacing Jesse Bates and Von Bell. And hey, don't forget about what Joseph Asai and Miles Murphy can do too um, going into the 2023 season. I'm going to go offense. And I was actually afraid that you would pick this player. I don't know why. I was like, hmm. It, maybe it's a surprise and it isn't a popular pick among Bengals fans, but you know, I was looking at Twitter and social media when I put that question out earlier today of breakout players or who you think. And a lot of people, Cam Taylor Britt, Dax Hill is named uh, a bunch of times. And I hope we see that out of Dax Hill. I really hope he shines in that role uh, because I know a lot of people were down on him after his rookie year, which I didn't understand because he really never played his natural position. And we're finally going to see that with Dax Hill. And I don't expect him to get it right away, but this is going to be maybe an October late October, early November kind of thing for him, hopefully sooner. Uh, you don't want to waste too many months in that position, but I'm going to go off into side of the ball. And the guy I'm going to pick, because I was thinking about it today, there's so many different players that I think you could look at on this youth uh, Bengals on both sides of the ball. Who would I pick? I'm going to go Cordell Volson. And okay. Some people, and, and I, I admit, I had a tweet this offseason. I said, you know, I hope he plays better. And I think a lot of people took it like, oh, my gosh, you're so down on Cordell Volson. That's so negative. Um, look what he was able to do his rookie year. You know, pass guard play, offensive line play, struggles and things like that. I think a lot of people see his play differently. Some people really optimistic what they saw in his rookie year. And some people are like, oh, it was okay. He can be better. And that's fine. I think they could all say that. But I will say him. I, I'm optimistic because of the guys in the offensive line room. Yeah, they had Ted Karras, Alex Kappa last year, but I just feel and 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 maybe I am kind of just feeling like, oh, the, the hype around Orlando Brown and what that's really going to bring. But I think that's going to be a difference maker for him and getting that year one under his belt. Now it's year two for him on this offensive line. So for me personally, I'm going to go Cordell Wilson because I kind of felt like he wouldn't have been somebody that I that I thought about a couple months ago that would have the breakout season. But I think it would be absolutely huge for the offensive line and just the future overall because you're not paying him a whole lot of money and everybody knows how much good guard play is getting in the NFL. And uh, yeah, I'll go Wilson. Interesting. I, I don't disagree. I think that's a good pick. Uh, when I said Irv Smith, only one I think I'd pick on offense wasn't a slight at Volson. It was a little bit a I didn't think about the offense. I was thinking skill players because I was trying I to know. think of I know. Yeah, I was trying to think of uh skill players as in like breakout, probably like, you know, exciting, whatever. Um the pros on Volson are I think he does have technical issues. I think that he can reach, you know, a higher ceiling by cleaning that up. The cons would be I think he's as old as Jonah Williams. So is he as athletically and powerfully maxed out as he's going to be? Um, but if he cleans up the technical stuff, it's a breakout. Like that, there's no other way around it. Where right now, I think he's fine. Is, is where I would probably describe his yeah. level of play. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't watch the AFC Championship game, but nobody really looked good in that game. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> watch the game before. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it was fine. I think if he's more consistent and if he's more technically sound, that can go, you know, up to what I would describe as like, I don't know, solid or what I keep using as what I want Volson to hit if he breaks out is you look at him and you go long term starter. You just yeah. check check the box. Like that's the long term left guard. You're not one like because if he stagnates and he plays the same level this year, I think you will get a little bit of the well, look at that left guard. Yeah, he's, maybe he's not asking for much money. Maybe get a little competition or left guard falls to you in the draft. And you go, well, uh, you know, <laughs> let's make it a competition. Well, guy falls in the first round. It's not much of a competition, but it's a competition. Or maybe it's just a second round guy. But if Wilson plays well enough, you're probably not looking at guard in the first two rounds at all because you're like, well, Kappa, that's long-term starter, Wilson and if he breaks out, long-term starter. So, yeah, I think it'd be great for the Bengals. That's one of the best breakouts the Bengals can get just because he's so cheap being a fourth-round pick. And I love the Irv Smith. Um, I think, you know, I, I hate doing this because I sound like everyone else, but it is the – and he needs to stay healthy. 
Um, because yeah. if he does stay healthy, that can be just a great weapon for this Bengals offense. I know a lot of people still look at the tight end room and they're like, eh, it's a little scary. But again, they don't utilize it as much as other teams when it comes to their offense. And he can be kind of a receiver type. And just hearing Brian Callahan, he was on lockdown Bengals maybe a couple weeks ago or sometime in June. And it's a really good episode listening to him talk about Irv Smith Jr. And I think he did one with Dave Lapham too. So go back and listen to that. And I think you can get really hyped because one thing we know about Brian Callahan, he is very honest and his interviews and he will talk a lot and tell you everything that's going on with the offense so I think he really believes in Irv Smith Jr and I'm I'm really excited to see what that's going to look like so yeah I'm all about more than one player and that's one thing that you can look out um, there's a lot of talent on the offensive side of the ball and on the defensive side of the ball but still plenty of players who could have a breakout season so we'll see what happens there and uh, we'll see if our our two people have a breakout year in 2023 but next we have to get to your twitter questions again you can follow bengals underscore sand you can follow me at ellen ds patterson on it's always game day in cincinnati We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Really proud of the social media, Twitter world, family, friends of the show for sending your questions. We'll go ahead and get to them now. Jake Lisko, speaking of Locked On Bengals, he said, compared to 2022, will Jamar Chase have more or less backfield snaps in 2023? <laughs> It'll be about the same, I think, but I'll go more for the excitement. He missed time, more, because I'm going to project him to be healthy. <laughs> I don't know about you. And look, I know I shouldn't buy into the Instagram videos and workouts because that's what we're going to see right now before everybody's in the best shape of their lives in a couple weeks. But Jamar Chase has been he's been on the track. He's been working out like no other. And he looks bigger. And he was already pretty stocky. So I don't know. I don't know what that means for him as a wide receiver, but. He's inching towards wide receiver number one for me right now. I've said it for a couple months now. I know Justin Jefferson and credit to him. He can be right up there and he could be number one for a lot of people. But Jamar Chase, I feel like it's going to be an exciting season. Hopefully all the health in the world for him and gets a full season. And we will continue with Adam Wheels. If Jonah Williams performs better than 2021, what is his worth in terms of his next contract? Would you sign him for that amount? Would and should the Bengals? Uh, well, if he plays better, he's probably going to be looked at as a right tackle. I think it's tough because my first thought was like, hey, maybe just go with like the Mike McGlinchey contract. But then I'm also like, I think Mike McGlinchey got paid a little bit too much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to real quick look up the SPO track for all right tackles because it's less than left tackle still, even in this day and age when it's not as important. Um, okay. Unless you're the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, well, they thought they're getting a left tackle. <laughs> and then he came to camp and he passed that from the left side. And they're like, hold on, guys. <laughs> yep. Um, let's see. Okay. So he's definitely not making Lane Johnson. Oh, my goodness. John Taylor makes $100,000 less than Lane Johnson per year. That's insane to me. Going to be my offensive line. <laughs> Mike McGlinchey's making seventeen and a half million dollars a year. That's that's too much, I think, for what I'm looking for here. Uh, could he get? My guess would be like somewhere between Caleb McGarry and Jack Conklin, which would put him at the eighth highest paid right tackle. This is considering he plays pretty good. Um, yeah, I'd, that'd be eleven and a half to fifteen million. So let's call it thirteen million a year. Four years, something like that. That's 40, 52. Yeah. I, Quick. I just feel like, and look, Jonah Williams has been a professional since he returned to the Cincinnati Bengals. And I don't really think he did anything wrong when everything kind of went down uh, when it comes to the conversations, all the trade conversation, the demand 48 hours after Orlando Brown signed with the Cincinnati Bengals. He came here and he's like, I'm ready to compete. And, and I love everything about that. I just personally feel it's going to be great for Jonah Williams and the Cincinnati Bengals if Jonah Williams has a 2021 year. That's great. That is amazing. That's good for him because he's going to get a bag. I just don't think it's going to be in Cincinnati. Yeah. I agree. I, I probably wouldn't even – I don't think I'd sign him to the contract either just because it's too much money mixed up there in the offensive line, in the tackle room specifically. Uh, but – so the scenario I have in mind, and this is like a 1% scenario, maybe less, 
of how Jonah Williams is a Bengal next year is he doesn't just play better, but he plays lights out, right? Like dominant right tackle. Maybe not even dominant, but like maybe pro bullish the right tackle level. No. Which is, yeah, I, no, already, already. You're probably already yelling like this is beyond a 1% scenario, but <laughs> the other half of it is. It is for Joe Burrow. Right. Logan Wilson is signed. T. Higgins is signed. So you've got your two pieces that need signed. You just got to throw the franchise tag out if he plays that well. <laughs> just like, let's run it back. Well, I'm going to make it really complicating right now because I just had that memory that this could be the last year of DJ Reader and play the sad music right now because it makes me sad thinking about it. What do you do about DJ Reader? Yeah. Um, I think he would get the average of the top five defensive tackles. They don't split that up with nose tackle, um, which I would still probably pay. I don't know how much it is. I think DJ Reader, I think I've talked about it. He's probably going to come in. 18 million a year. I don't think he's going to do the, I don't think he's going to get to the Dexter Lawrence and Quinn and Williams money just because those guys are better pass rushers. And that's what really gets paid. Even though I think reader might be the best defensive, you know, run stopping nose tackle in the league. Uh, I mean, I'm hoping they're looking at a two to three year deal with them. That's what I would look for. If you want a franchise to, Let's throw out the scenario. Jonah Williams does not play like a Pro Bowl right tackle. <laughs> and yeah, letting, yeah. Sorry, Jonah. They're, they're letting him go. That was just my scenario for how he is a Bengal next year. Is just like if he plays that well and you have everybody signed up, like sure, throw throw the franchise tag at him and let's just run it back a year. Uh, when it comes to Reader, which is this is a, not even a question, just different topic. I know, sorry, I had to throw it in because I'm but, thinking about it today. But I get it. Uh, I think with Reader, it would be. He could get the franchise tag if he continues his level of play. I think that would be one where you're going to want to not have something that's going to take up your cap for this year coming up because it's just a ton of cap this year and then nothing, obviously. I I just like that two to three year, $18 million type deal and just keep the what has been the centerpiece of your defense keep that there for the next couple of years because he's a nose tackle. He doesn't rely a ton on athleticism or something that would degrade really quickly over time, have a way to get out in year three, year four. I think, I mean, if you want to have his years, 28, 29, 30, 31 season as a Bengal, I don't think he's going to fall off a cliff. I, I just don't think nose tackle falls off until you get into like 32, 33, 34. Uh, but do I think the Bengals will do that? I don't either. And it makes me really sad. And also when you bring up franchise tag, I think if they don't get a deal done with T Higgins, they're going to franchise. Tag. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big one is they're going to tag T if they, if the, that, that's why part of the Jonah Williams scenario was T and Wilson are signed to long-term deals. Yeah, because really otherwise, otherwise you're looking at a different tag there. It sounds like great problems. And I hope that is something that the Bengals have to worry about. Um, maybe it's towards the end of the season. And honestly, I've said it before, we're getting close to training camp. And I felt like the Joe Burrow extension will be done the first or second week of training camp. And we are getting very close to see if that gets done. And I do feel like it will be before the season, but stay tuned for that. All the contract extension stuff. David Speakman says, what's the plan for third and short this year? I mean... Based off last year, quarterback sneaks. <laughs> Second and short, third and short. We, we know what's coming. No. Um, yeah, I, Mixon's going to be your short yardage back. I don't think any of the other guys have the power to do it. If you bring in a Zeke, that's probably your short yardage back. I think he's still really good at that. He almost has fullback qualities at this point in his career where short yardage, pass protection, blocking, like all great. Running, eh. <laughs> you know, fine. <laughs> um, but so right now, Mixon, just going by the roster, he's your short yardage back. I think uh, I'd have to look into the Bengals short yardage play in last year. It felt like early on, it was a lot of let's just keep pounding Mixon right into the offensive line and try to pick up that yard. Uh, but I felt like it changed a little bit when they went so gun heavy. What I would like to see is this is where I think I would like to see when people keep talking about all the RPOs and stuff, this I think would be a scenario you might want to do that just because short yardage, the defense will trigger harder on those run fakes. So maybe you get a guy in space, like a Jamar chase in space or 
it could even be Irv in space, just somebody in space because the defense crashed like that. Um, play action is also really useful, third and short, if you're confident that you can go out there on fourth down and pick it up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to see a better third third and short, short yardage package besides the quarterback sneak. I just, to me, it's such a wasted opportunity be, to be quarterback sneaking on second and short and even really third and short, unless it's, unless you're in like the red zone or you're backed up. I think those both are fine to do a quarterback sneak on like third and one type scenarios, but yeah, I don't know. Run fakes and the run game also being a little bit better is what I would look for. What any other thoughts with short yardage? Yeah, I don't I don't want any quarterback sneaks. I I don't I don't I don't need any of that. They did so many on like second and one. That's such a scenario to just throw up the deep ball to one of your all-star wide receivers and instead it's it's quarterback sneak time. No, absolutely. I don't want any jet sweeps. That's where I don't want the jet sweep. I know I get the idea of it. I but that Carlos Dunlap tackle <laughs> in the nor in the uh Regular season matchup with yeah. the Chiefs that just lives in my head. Like yeah, you usually leave that guy unblocked. Like I, I, I understand how it happened. I understand the thought process here. You knew like, exactly what was about to happen. I yep. yeah, no more, no more. Uh, made me a little nervous. So yeah, I love your game plan. That works out. Uh, Eric says, "What do you think the Bengals can do with the new offensive line makeup as far as developing the cohesion between the passing and the run game? Will they still be a run, uh, be a gun running team, or will they have uh, play action really be, be a bigger part?" They're going to be gun running. They're going to be a gun heavy team. What I think that they've been doing. And I mean, it could be confirmation bias because this is what I thought they should have been doing this offseason is trying to find a way to make their shotgun play action game more viable. I don't think you play action in the run game is always going to be better when you go under center, but that's in theory. Joe Burrow has not been better every time he's gone under center for that play action stuff. And the offensive line, really, they've done they've done a better job in Joe Mixon's system. They've been more efficient when they've been running from the gun. So I think that would be – I think you're still going to look at very gun-heavy offense. I just think they're going to try different ways to make their play action from the gun more explosive, a bigger way to attack defenses. All right, we'll move on to one more in the segment. Serge says, guess for the, this is a three-parter. So remember everything I'm about to tell you. Guess for the year's cash and cap hit for Mixon's restructured contract. Chances Collins still gets cut. Sports track shows that we can save 7.7 7 on the 2023 cap with only 1.7 in dead cap in 2024 and 2025. I'm quite certain the new safety combo will cost us one game. Thoughts? I don't know about cost a game. There's more. They, they'll probably have a, I don't want to start with the third part, but we're going to start the third part. <laughs> I don't think they'll cost a game. At least I don't want to say that. Like it could happen, but anytime you lose a game, it's never just because of one duo or one guy or anything like that. Just like that AFC championship game. Yes, you could blame Joseph Osai. They're not in that position without him because of the pressure he was able to bring one of the only defensive linemen to bring pressure. So let's say a safety duo has a miscommunication. They give up a long touchdown in the fourth quarter and you just look like, Hey, that we should have been ahead more. We should have, it shouldn't have been up in the air for that play. Uh, but I do get the concern because I think there, I think early on you're going to see a couple miscommunications that are just going to be like, Ugh. you haven't seen that in years for the Bengals because of Bates and Bell. Um, the second part, what are the chances Collins gets cut? I personally, I don't think they're that likely just because I don't know what they're going to do with the money other than re-sign guys. And then the last one was Mixon restructured contract. Yeah. Do you, do you still think he gets restructured? I do. I do. Okay. And maybe this is more behind the scenes and we won't, you know, see the, all the details of what the restructure looks like. But I do think that it'll be restructured. And I kind of think, um, you know, the connection with Lyle Collins, I, I don't think he's getting cut. I think if they feel very confident, I know he's in Cincinnati working out right now. 
Um, and that's absolutely huge. I don't see him starting the season or taking over Jonah Williams' job when it comes to the right tackle position, but I think it's very smart of the Cincinnati Bengals to just keep him on the roster. Um, you'll have that offensive line depth, and it gives Lyle Collins time to rehab and feel good to go when they do bring him up and he's on the active roster. For the offensive line depth, uh, we'll see what it looks like. And then for Joe Mixon, yeah, I think I think you have to, and I, and I hate that being the topic of conversation because I've said plenty of times on the podcast, I am over the Joe Mixon talk. He's going to be the RB1 this year, and um, that's totally fine. I hope he has a great year. But for me personally, I think that there is that conversation behind the scenes. And, yeah, the Bengals are, are really, um, you know, they're pretty good at saying, hey, this is what we said we were going to pay you. This is what you're going to get out of your contract. But I just I feel like there's a little restructure going on with that. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get more years. I don't think this is a restructure as in you're going to spread the money out and keep him for three more years or something. It would literally be a pay cut is what they're talking about. And my guess is getting him down to something that feels more manageable, whether that's $10 million, $8 million, something like that. Um, I still think this happens in conjunction with a move, which could be an extension, just like if we could use the wiggle room here now because Burrow's making more money this year or Higgins is making more money this year. So we're going to cut you down so we can keep our guys. The one point against Lyle Collins is that $7 million, a little bit wild. That's the 12th highest paid right tackle by uh, in the, in the league. That's wild to me. Yeah. Uh, so it's right in between George Fant and Trent Brown, um, which those two are, are starters. Yeah. I, think. I, I, think I just think starters. You, you can't go wrong when you look at you look at the Super Bowl from 2021 season and you look at last year, how the season ended. And I feel like you are an offensive line piece away, a healthy offensive line piece away from winning at least one Lombardi right now. And that I'm, is absolutely huge. I'm, and I'm with you. And I don't think there's a move that you're going to make in free agency at this point. You're so healthy with the cap. You have all this cap space. There's no real point in the owner saving money by cutting a guy. He's all these guys are talented. No point in getting that guy out of here just to get him out of here. You have to have a plan with the money. And that could just be extensions. But I just I think you have to have a plan with any of these moves that are just making more money. Now, if you would have asked what the start of March before all this free agency stuff happened, then all these things would have made sense. But when yeah. you're at this point, you're kind of at like, well, I mean, Dalton Rister is not going to make a lot of money if you really want to sign him. <laughs> he's yeah. he's in free agency still because teams aren't interested or whoever else you're thinking of. I mean, I, I'm still looking at Melvin Ingram, even though I think that dream's gone because they, they drafted an edge rusher in the first round, but just some, maybe an old defensive tackle that you could just bring in for a year, just a tiny bit of juice. Yeah, I'll make this really quick before we go into our last segment. Uh, with Joe Mixon, when it comes to restructure, I could see him um, because I know he has a great relationship with the front office and they're having that conversation. The front office goes, hey, what about two to three million dollars of your contract goes to Joe Burrow and, or T. Higgins mm -hmm. um, contract? You, you want to be here. AFC team, you know what this offense is, real big contender, stay here in Cincinnati, still get a nice chunk of change here, more than he would at any other team, um, and still give him his his bag, he deserves it, he's been here for a long time, and, and he's done, uh, you know, really great, I know how last season, you know, worked out for him, but personally, I think this is going to be a good rebound year for him, and maybe those conversations happen, and he says, you know what, we got to get my guy paid, let's go. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but I feel like all that stuff, if it's happening behind the scenes, those conversations are probably happening. I do trust the people and the insiders who are over there covering the team when they do talk about that stuff. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the next few weeks, but we'll get to more of your questions next on it's always game day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Thank you so much again for sending your questions. I would say it's not super offensive line heavy. I know we answered a couple questions when it comes to the offensive line, but there are a few others. We'll go ahead and get to that right now. Mr. Neb says, for the average fan, what is the surprising, most pressing need for the Bengals? Um, well, I don't think they really have any holes on the starting roster when you look at it next year i think there's some spots that still need filled and there might be plans for there but there might they might not work so when i'm thinking about next year in terms of what you could look for i think dj turner is the plan for a if he's not back i think 
you're looking tight end is what is just a recycling one year deal every mm-hmm. year. So that's going to be in, uh, that's a need for next year. Um, running back is a need for next year because Mix is on his last year of his deal. Uh, slot receiver is still a need for next year. I, I know we're all excited about Charlie Jones, but that that is a fourth round pick. And those guys typically are not starters. So you're hoping that hits. Like if he's a starter, that's already a double. Even if he's not like a good starter, it's like you already hit a double on that. He's a starting level player. Yeah. So I think that could be a need. And that just might be one that we're not thinking of because we're all excited about Charlie Jones. Um, I do think sneaky need would be, I still think they could use a defensive tackle. It doesn't feel like they feel like they could use that, but I think they could because they like to roll three defensive tackles out there when they play, you know, against heavy personnel teams and want to get into their base down stuff, their heavy stuff. They like to be three, four. Um, and then I think the sneaky need would be backup nose tackle and for next year, nose tackle. Because who is the other nose tackle? Is it just Josh Dupo? <laughs> Which, even as a backup, I'm like, well, you could probably get a better backup than yeah. Tupo at this point. Yeah, he had his day. <laughs> now it's gone a little bit down. But do you have any other guys you're looking at? Uh, when it comes to that question, not really. I mean, I feel like it's it's easy to go into all kinds of different position groups. I think you bring up a really good point with, with Charlie Jones. And I know the excitement's there. I see it on social media where it's, it's Chuck Sizzle. Chuck Sizzle, maybe he's going to be the breakout player. And I just don't think he's going to get enough reps to be the breakout player. I don't think I could put him in that category. His excitement, maybe it's going to be more of a special teams guy. And he'll get a few reps here and there. And yeah, he's more than likely probably going to be, it's hard to say this too, the Tyler Boyd replacement going into the 2024 season. So we'll see what the offense wants to do as far as his rookie year. Do you put him out there for a few reps or you're like, "Mm, he's more of a special teamer. I just don't see them ever thinking in 2023, let's take Tyler Boyd off the field to put the rookie in. Yeah. Um, They're not going to do that because they're contenders. I think that's the big deal there. One, one that I didn't think of, and I do think this actually fits the bill. Now that I've thought about this enough, the sneaky need for next year is linebacker. Because we all keep assuming Logan Wilson's coming back. And I it could it, – look, this could just happen. He just gets re-signed in like tomorrow. August. Tomorrow. <laughs> it could happen in July. But if he's not re-signed before the year, let's not just you know put the cart before – because we did that with Von Bell. Everybody. I think every Bengals That's analyst, it. both of us, everybody was like, oh, yeah, Von Bell's probably back. <laughs> yeah, I think they like, thought he was on. back. Yeah, yeah. And so everybody thinks he, he was coming back, and then, oh, he, he's gone. <laughs> Safety is a need. Uh, so I think that could be the real sneaky one, and I, I don't think fans want to hear that because Logan Wilson is very beloved. Uh, but you just look at it, and you're like, well, I guess they paid Pratt. So do they want to – that was always the argument on why Pratt was gone is they're not going to pay two linebackers. Well, they paid one. Um, I think Logan Wilson's back, but this is just me making the case for why we might want to look at linebacker as a sneaky need for next year. Yeah, I think Logan Wilson's back too. Um, He's just the perfect player for them to extend. I don't know what it is. It just kind of always felt like as soon as they drafted him, he was going to be a Cincinnati Bengal for quite some time, definitely in his prime, and he's still really young, uh, drafted him in the 2020 draft. And it's just crazy what they were able to pick up in that draft. And, yes, they were able to get Jermaine Pratt back at a really good deal. I feel like the linebacker market is perfect. I really don't want them to wait until after this season and then try to work something out next year with them or right when the season ends. I think that's a little scary personally. So I would try to work something out right now, but let me ask you this. And I know they're two totally different positions. Would you rather have Logan Wilson or DJ reader? Okay. Logan Wilson will be 28 next, uh, next year, 2024 DJ reader. Cause you're probably looking at a pretty long deal for Wilson is my first thought. Yes. Be- just because this will be his first this will be a second contract. You're looking at reader for his third contract. So reader can really kind of take the, you're not going to get your giant payday. Cause that just happened for him. Yeah. Reader will be 30. 
I, I, mm, it's about equal. I think I would, I think I would prioritize reader out of the two. That, oh, okay, you're in the same spot. I thought that was be a very big hot take. No, I don't think it's a very a big hot take. And I think that's where your conversations are currently at. I mean, if if they extend Joe, which I, I hate even saying if, I do feel very confident they're going to extend Joe in training camp, if not sooner, if not the day before training camp starts, which is crazy to think about because it's less than two weeks away. But I think then you think of the T Higgins and what's going to happen with T Higgins. If you don't get something done with T Higgins before the season starts, it feels like a franchise tag. I, I think you you can't let him go. You can't let him go after this year. That is, I feel like that would be a very bad decision. And I know you have to pay Jamar Chase and other guys on this team, but that would be terrible. Don't do that. Uh, so outside of that, you look at the other guys who are up for an extension. I think you, if you can't get something done with Logan Wilson, I think you just let it play out and you say, all right, DJ reader, we have we have some money bags available. They were going to go to Logan Wilson, but you know what? We're thinking let's do a three year deal with DJ Reader. Yeah, three year deal or a four fake four year where it's like four years, but really you got like the easy out in the fourth year. Um, I'm going to real quickly look at the linebacker market because yeah. I think it's good and bad because yeah. we're looking at. If he plays in the Jermaine Pratt, David Long type waters, I think Logan Wilson's back. Like, there's no way they don't pay him that. But let's not forget Roquan Smith just got paid $20 million a year. Yeah. And Tremaine Edmonds just got paid $18 million a year. So that's where you're looking at. If he's looking at, like, well, I'm as good as Tremaine Edmonds, which I think he is. <laughs> Does he go, give me 18, give me $19 million a year. I'm better than that guy. Then you're kind of looking at it like, well, him for 19 or a reader for 18. Neither one is really a premium, premium position. And with the linebacker market being so split right now, where the top of the top is getting, they're being paid. But everybody who's just underneath that, like the good players, the Jermaine Pratts, the David Longs, uh, who went to Miami. Uh, I mean, I think Aziz Al Shair got a great deal for the titans not for him <laughs> it's like these guys should be making more money and do you just kind of grab one of them uh, that could also depend this is all going out the window when logan it is signed for the week. We can. but yeah. but but before this podcast comes out then we'll do one on joe burrow on on thursday on the next one we'll, 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 we're here. but but do you just grab one of those guys do you just go like ah, wilson's better than this guy we're going to bring in but He's making ten million dollars less a year, or yeah, yes, a year. You do that. That, that, do that. It, it's exactly what I keep thinking on. It's just like we keep assuming Wilson's back, and I and I think it's what like seventy percent chance that he's a Bengal next year. I think they're going to sign him, but that thirty percent is not zero. It was just like Von Bell, where we just assumed and assumed, and then he was gone. Um, so that and then they played in the Nick Scott waters, which was very much a this guy's fine. We'll he's see, a fine yeah. starter. Yeah, and get a starting level player for much cheaper. So is that where they go? I don't know. I It's really interesting to me. And I just wish these guys were signed, though. I, I do wish they were signed. Here's the thing, because when I thought, and I'm so sorry, you guys have great questions. There's one more I really do want to get to after this, but I'll make this really quickly. Uh, but with uh, Akeem Davis-Gaither, when I thought Jermaine Pratt was going to be gone, I thought it was going to be Logan Wilson. And I'm like, oh, it's your time, Akeem Davis-Gaither. Mm -hmm. This is your well, time. You were kind of a three-man competition, right? Like, Akeem Davis-Gaither would be the front runner, but right now I think we'd be having a lot of talk about Akeem Davis-Gaither, Davis... I know. Davis-Gaither. Yeah. Akeem Davis-Gaither versus Joe Batchy versus Marcus yeah. Bailey. And I think you'd be looking at, like, who's going to take that every down role? And this would also be the scenario that I think you go, like, and Jordan Battle. <laughs> but because they have the two linebackers, I don't think Jordan yeah. Battle sees the field as much. I just think you're going to want to keep those linebackers on the field. But yeah. And then you're also probably looking at the draft. Uh, maybe there's a fourth guy from that. Or maybe, like I said, you just sign one of those guys that are they're good and they're $8 million a year. Do you just grab one of those guys, which are, I think, for the market, undervalued? Like that, that's a great market to be playing in right now. I think you do. I, it's harder to replace DJ Reader than I hate saying that. I hate saying this. And there's nothing against Logan Wilson. He is awesome. And I really hope they extend him. I'm going to be so pumped if they do. Um, and find a way to do it all. Find a way to do it all. 
Uh, That's yeah. right. The cap is cap only going to go up. It's going to go up. You're going to get, you know, just keep making that money, that gate money, that Taylor Swift money, everything. <laughs> Make sure you're you're keeping that bank and those bags ready to go for for your core players. And I think Beyonce's he, coming, right? They're trying to get Beyonce because the Pittsburgh thing didn't work out. So uh, they're saying, hey, Beyonce, come over to Paycor. Look what we can do. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But, I mean, it's a crazy conversation. And it's one that we have to actually get serious about because it is going to happen. We will make this really quickly. Uh, quickly. Quick, quick, quick. I can't even talk. Quick. Bench Warmer says, when we saw the beginning of last season, opposing defenses throwing cover two at Burrow effectively before he started to adapt to it. What do you think defenses are going to try to do to slow the offense down? I think you look at the quarters stuff a lot of people have done. I think you want to – I think you definitely want to – when you play against the Bengals, you want to take away explosive plays. And the way the Ravens have done that, the Broncos did two years ago, um, the way – well, a lot of teams took away explosive plays, but you also want to limit them efficiency-wise as well. I think when you can play quarters and you can dominate their offensive line a little bit, like if you have the defensive line to do it, but they might just try it anyway. But you're just going to play like quarters, but you're going to kind of play the safeties back a little bit. I don't think you want to try to jump underneath stuff. I think you just you want to have that presence over the top but still be able to react to the run game so that they're not killing you on the ground. I think instead of cover two, you'll see more quarters stuff. I also think the Bengals are going to be, I hope at least the Bengals are going to be more ready for this stuff. Uh, I do think they had, they left stuff on the field in that game against um, the Ravens, but is what it is. And the offensive line stunk in that game. So that also hurts them. So uh, yeah, schematically quarters, what Jamar Chase called six strong, which I think will is essentially quarter, quarter, half. And that half is always on Jamar Chase. So you have a guy underneath and over the top. Um, and you'll probably get some, some cover three type stuff out of it where one of the safes is going to take away the middle of the field. Uh, but I don't think you're going to major in that against the Bengals just because of what they can do on the outside. So you're going to try to take away the outside, take away deep and make them beat you everywhere else. Uh, that's at least what I would be preparing for. Yeah, it's something I agree with you. I think they're going to be ready for it this off season. And it's still crazy. I think a lot of teams and definitely somebody at the top of the AFC to say, hey, you're getting your whole coaching staff back. I think Dan Pitcher is someone we don't talk enough about. And um, I know even the Bucks were looking at him as an offensive coordinator. You get Troy Walters over in the wide receiver room, Brian Callahan, Joe Burrow, Zach Taylor. I feel like Zach Taylor, there was a great podcast, actually, uh, Mina Kimes did. I, I just retweeted it with one of the PFF guys, and they talked about Zach Taylor. And, and I do, I think he he's getting better as a play caller. And I know a lot of people are like, well, it's about time. Come on. But no, really, I think it's it's extremely important for him. And there are plenty of games. And I actually, we're going to get to it for next week's podcast a little more in depth because we did the coach profile on Lou Anarumo and we want to go to the offensive coordinator side. So there's a lot of guys to talk about when it comes to calling plays. But I agree with you. I think it's going to be um, different going into the season with the offense. And there are there are plenty of games you can look at in 2022 and you'd be like, oh. They left some things off off the field, and um, maybe they'll they'll have more in the bag and, and other guys and other offensive weapons that they'll be able to utilize. So we will see what happens on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, thanks, everybody, for sending your questions. Several questions we actually did not get to. Sorry we were rambling. That's what always happens. We'll get a lot of questions, and then I find a topic, and I'm like, wait a minute. We have to talk more about this. Contract extensions, DJ Reader, Logan Wilson. And I don't think it's a hot take. Um, I think it's a conversation that's, that's going to be happening if it's going into the season or even um, soon as the 2023 season ends. But I hope DJ Reader is a Cincinnati Bengal after this year to be determined. We will talk more extensions, training camp. As we get into next week, it'll be the week before camp starts. Maybe a special guest. So stay tuned to It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. You can follow along, Bengals underscore Sands. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. Thank you again for listening to It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati.